All right. So I I can't. I know a bunch of you are obsessed with samurais and that's what we're going to start talking about today, but we also have to figure out what led up to the rise of the samurai and why these warriors became so important in Japanese cu culture and society during this time. So today we're going to be able to explain the rise of the Fujiwara clan and rival clans as they struggle for power in Japan at this time. We have a do now, we have some notes, guided practice and independent practice. Today is National Tell a Fairy Tale Day. So if you and your friends are just hanging out, go ahead and tell each other a fairy tale. All right, the do now you have is you have a map practice. Um, it is asking you or saying most of the northern boundary of the United States was created by treaties between the United States and. A treaty is basically an agreement um, that a country has with another country. Um, so like if we're, after World War I, there was the Treaty of Versailles, which basically said um, that there were just stipulations that like the United States agreed um, with Britain and Germany so that the war would be over. What that ends up doing is that ends up inevitably causing World War II, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, so if you wanna pause the video and take a look at your map and break it down and then we will come back together for the answers. All right, so for the do now, I have the answer is number two or Great Britain. And the reason I know that is because it says the Northern Boundary. So I'm gonna go all the way up to the Northern Boundary and I see Treaty with Great Britain, ceded by Great Britain. Um, another adjusted with Great Britain. So we see all those agreements and treaties, specifically the word treaty, has to do with Great Britain. And then you can see down here, we have Florida um, with, with, was ceded by Spain, which means Spain took it. So we only have two keywords today. Our first keyword is a little bit tricky to understand, but it's a figurehead. A figurehead is a ruler who appears to be in charge, but someone else is really in control. Um, so we kind of talked about that. Well, it's similar to it, like when we talked about a regent yesterday, when a regent was someone who ruled for another person because they couldn't, so typically of age. Um, but a figurehead is different where that they are not the ruler appears to be in charge, but they're not. So we're gonna see this in Japan. We can see this today with Great Britain or England with Queen Elizabeth. She's the queen, but she has not a lot of political influence or power. She's just a figurehead. She's just kind of there and she's respected and recognized as the queen, but she's not doing most of the work. Most of the work is being done by the prime minister of Great Britain who would be the equivalent to our president. So she actually doesn't do that, really anything with the government, um, but we know her as the queen. But in Japan, we have the Shogun, and the Shogun is a supreme military commander. He actually has more power than the emperor, and that's our figurehead. So the emperor is still the emperor and is recognized and respected as the emperor, but the Shogun, holds all the true power in medieval Japan. So the, an example with this would be like a commander in chief. In the United States, our commander in chief just also happens to be the president of the United States, but he or she is ultimately in charge of the military. That's why you can say um, we have the president makes like declaration of wars and things like that, or makes the um, orders to send troops to different places because they are in charge of the military. The emperor in Japan was not, the shogun was, so they actually had all of the power. Um, this is the imperial palace that's going to be built um, during the he or in Heian, um, which was a city. Um, it is now known as Kyoto. Um, it is no longer called Heian, it's now Kyoto. And this kind of just shows how the imperial palace was laid out. So this is the um, building that the emperor would live in. And um, then you have nobles who had bigger houses that were closer to the imperial palace. 
And then you had um, a long street with, um, they even had like street numbers and things like that. You can still go there today. You do have to have a reservation to go. Um, and this was before COVID. You just have to have a reservation. Um, but if you click on the link, I'm not going to show it now, but if you click on this link, it's about a seven minute video of a guy um, going to the Imperial Palace and walking through it. And this is just a shot from the outside. You can see this is very finely kept gravel or sand. And then here are some other pictures from it. Um, so we have obviously very ornate, very beautiful. You can see when we think of a palace, we think of a single building, but this is more of like a compound where there's thousands of buildings um, and beautiful scenery as well. So we're going to go ahead and get started. If I look before we start reading, I can see that we're going to be looking for um, or working with cause and effect. So um, we need to find what caused a person to receive influence and privileges in the imperial court. And then what was the basis for gaining a job in China and then in Japan? Because we already have talked about how people got jobs in China, but it's a little bit different in Japan. So I want to know that difference. Prince Shotoku and other reformers tried to unify Japan. They had only limited success. Over time, the power of the emperor faded and Japan became a violent land ruled by rival warriors. Peace was only restored around 1600. By tradition, each new Japanese emperor set up court in his own territory. Then, in 794, the imperial court settled in a new capital city, Heian. The name meant capital of peace and tranquility. It later became known as Kyoto. It was modeled after the Chinese city of Chang'an. Emperors lived in Heian for more than a thousand years, but during that time, their power began to shift into other hands. The imperial court was divided into different ranks or levels of nobles. Privileges and influence depended mainly on one's rank. Unlike China, Japan did not give out government jobs based on merit. Most officials were sons from noble families. The emperor and nobles of the court appeared to live wonderful lives. Their nights and days were filled with dinner parties, dances, poetry, contests, music, and religious rituals. They also produced magnificent art and literature. Among these nobles, the Fujiwara family stood out. Let me move my face. I'll put my face by my other face. All right, so you can go ahead and pause the video. We want to know what caused a person to gain privilege and influence in the imperial court and the difference between getting jobs in China and getting jobs in Japan during this time. So go ahead and pause. All right, so if I look right here in the text, it tells me right out the out the gate, privileges and influence depended mainly on one's rank. So our cause is a person is born into a specific rank or ranking. The effect of this is that the person received a certain amount of influence or privileges in the imperial court. What was the basis for gaining a government job in China and in Japan? You can see here in the very end of that paragraph as well, it says, unlike China, Japan did not give out government jobs based on merit. Most officials were sons from noble families. So again, we're not, China is not like, or Japan is not like China, where in China, remember, they took the civil service exams. They could earn their spot in the government, um, government jobs. That is not how it works in Japan. So in China, government jobs were obtained by merit, while in Japan, government officials were from noble families. So you can pause and get that down. And then for your independent practice, you are just reading about the Fujiwara. And this here, number four, explain the sentence, the emperor was a figurehead. I want to know what that means. If it's, it says the emperor was a figurehead, what about the emperor makes him a figurehead? Use your notes to help you with that one, please. Then you're going to read about military leaders and um, Minamoto, um, specifically Minamoto Yoritomo, um, who's going to end up becoming the most powerful person in Japan. 
It's going to be the first shogun, the first commander, supreme military commander. Finish up with Yoritomo, and then you're good, okay? So you all have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you on Monday, which marks the first day of National Women's History Month. So we just finished up Black History Month. We're now moving into National Women's History Month. So I will be um, giving you fun facts about um, women's history during that month. All right. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys.